is Toby Reyes. This makes a lot of sense to me now. I had the chance to golf with David nine holes this last week. He hit this good shot and broke in that same routine on the 15th <laughs> fairway. It was a little crazy, but now it makes sense. So um, that was beautiful. And I, I love uh, any chance I get to see Toby dance is, uh, a, is a gift. Because uh, it's beautiful. It's remarkable. So this is Christine, as you know. Um, Toby, how long have you been dancing ballet? I've been dancing for seven and a half years. How old are you? Twelve. All right. Wow, she must have been a hurried child. Uh, Christine, how about you? You have a, a little experience with ballet as well. Yes, I started ballet when I was four, took lessons until I was about Toby's age, and um, on and off through high school and college. And then as an adult, I taught ballet for gymnastics. Wow. So. You started when you were five. How long have you been dancing ballet? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> now, when you learned, um, did you learn the same way that Toby is learning? Yes, the combinations that she's doing today are the same combinations I was doing 40, 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> and. Uh, still the same combinations? Same combinations. Uh, you, you do these combinations at the bar. You'll do combinations on, in the center of the room and then across the floor. Now, I don't know what combinations are, so okay, can you show so us? Okay, so Toby's going to show us a couple combinations at the bar. Uh, these are plies. And then some, uh, some tendus. And some... On do develop pace. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. <laughs> and when when do you practice these? Uh, for in ballet, you start you start the class like that. You do the, these things for like thirty to forty five minutes. Every practice. Every every, every lesson. Yeah, every lesson. And how many times a week, Toby, for you? Just once for her, for, for ballet, okay. two hours. But. So every lesson, you're there for two hours, mm -hmm. and you spend 45 minutes on this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so whether you're a young dancer or a principal dancer, you're going to keep doing these, these basics at the bar. This will never leave you. You're always doing them. Why do you do them? So, so, so your posture, so your alignment is correct, so your arms, your hands, um, your face, your head, everything is, it's ingrained in you and it shows up in your dance movements and it gets, you do it so many times that when it, it's in your dance movement, you don't even think about it, it's second nature. So, Toby, do they get boring? <laughs> it's okay to say yes. Yeah. It's not always fun. Um, Toby, what other dance styles do you dance? Yeah, give her the mic, Mom. Um, I take hip hop, jazz, contemporary, and character. Wow. And do these things help you in those other dances? Yeah, <laughs> they do. The, the movements will show. I mean, you can tell when somebody's had ballet training, it will show in all the other dance styles. And, it, and it's, it's just it's a foundation for a lot of the dance styles. Okay. Well, we're going to talk about this some more in just a minute. But before we do, Toby, would you do one more dance for us? Okay. Okay.
Thank you. Kids, you're dismissed to go to the other building. Thank you, Toby, very much. Thank you, Christine. So, it's beautiful to see someone dance when they have put in the time. I was thinking about the same thing uh, about Bill Harris on the guitar this morning. It's fun to listen to someone play the guitar when they put in the time. It's really a gift to us. Um, and I, I, David suggested that uh, Toby help us understand the way that practice is connected to beauty in ballet. Practice is connected to beauty in life. You cannot live a beautiful life without practice. Now, what you practice is important, and that's what we're talking about today. I, I want to talk in a little bit about a misunderstanding that uh, so many of us have. It's kind of endemic, really. And by the way, uh, Bola, I hear it's going viral. So we will be... <laughs> Karen did a great job with announcements, and uh, it's fun because I mentioned the bola, um, which is just a, you know, you just bring a bowl of something to a big meal. That's on the 13th of November. I mentioned it at a meditation class this week, and people were very excited about uh, joining us. So it's going to be really interesting. Invite a friend. It's just a great time to sit down and have a meal. It's like, it's like uh, the slow food movement meets really good mashed potatoes. And uh, I love that. So I want to invite you into this space on that Thursday evening. And I know you, you don't have to rush home. You know, I know if you're a commuter and, you know, just come when you can. It's okay. There's plenty of food left. Um, so we've been talking about these ways, ancient ways, of kind of indicating spiritual wellness. And I want to continue that this morning. And, but I want, to, I want to do it in a way that I think is going to be most helpful. The church father said that there were really three things that helped us understand um, what spiritual wellness is. Three indicators. Um, one is living without resentment. Now, that's not easy. We talked about that a few weeks ago. It certainly didn't exhaust it. But living without resentment. The antidote for resentment, forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't easy often misunderstood, it's one of the practices that we have to kind of live in. The second is living with no reactions. Now, that one's a little harder to understand. No reactions. And, and we're going to understand it more today. We started this one last week, but understanding it more by understanding its opposite, which is a compassionate response. Does that make sense? A reaction is um, someone else is controlling you. You can make me do whatever you want to make me do. We call it pushing buttons, and we know how to push one another's buttons. I can elicit a, a reaction from you. A response is you being kind of in control of who you are and where you are, and it is a, a genuinely compassionate way. Kyle, welcome home, Kyle. Kyle's just home from basic training, right? I am really glad to see you. Wow. I thought, who is that handsome man with Miriam? <laughs> it's her son. Wow, I'm glad to see you. Everything is good? I'm glad you're here. Make sure you greet him before you leave. Hmm. That was a reaction, wasn't it? Nuts. <laughs> and the third is maintaining inner peace, a sense of calm and quiet in my soul. They're all three related. And I think they're three, they're in an order that's important as well. These things are indicated all through scripture. And, and actually, any spiritual tradition that you would begin to investigate and you would find them in one form or another involved in that tradition. And that is terribly important, I think. Now, I have come up here um, without sermon notes. So can someone grab me a copy? Thank you. Thank you, Robin. So the antidote um, for a reaction is, is just this idea of uh, a response that's bathed in compassion. 
Listen to this passage. This is uh, Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is talking. I'm going to refer to the sermon that he's in in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 a, a lot today. It's the Sermon on the Mount. It's like his best stuff. Um, and so, and, and, you know, um, he is talking about things that are really important. And in Matthew chapter 5, he says this. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? That's a great question, right? I mean, that's kind of how we live. A lot of people live eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You hit me, I'll hit you back. Quid pro quo, tit for tat. Um, you shoot one missile at me, I'm going to shoot two back. And by the way, I had a great question this week about this uh, concerning uh, what's happening all over the world with uh, war and justice and injustice. And that's really a big conversation that would be kind of fun to have. Maybe one evening at Moylan's we could just do like a discussion group about how does this uh, loving response, this compassionate response impact ISIS, for example? I think that's a great discussion. So Jesus continues. Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Now, that's, that's easy. And really, uh, that paragraph will help all of us understand whether we're living kind of in a, in a deep intimacy with God or not. Because if you are, that will begin to happen. And if you're not, it won't. That's pretty simple. What do I mean? Here's what I mean. And I want to talk just for a second about something that I call the great misunderstanding. The great misunderstanding is simply this. Somehow, we've been misled into thinking that what you believe makes you Christian. Oh, here he goes again. He's got to make me nervous. Uh, this is what I mean. This is a very, very sad situation, and it's allowed humanity to descend into a place where this kind of misguided Christianity is not only not hopeful and kind of... Um, uh, inspiring and good news, but it's actually become part of the problem, that kind of Christianity. Now, we have lived in that kind of a landscape for so long that when I say this great misunderstanding is that we think what you believe makes you a Christian, that gets us very nervous. And many of us could list a lot of different beliefs or doctrines or dogmas that seem to indicate a general sense of orthodoxy in, in Christian terms. When Jesus was leaving, he left these final instructions to his disciples. Last words. Uh, last words are pretty important. And in Matthew 28, verse 20, he says this, last phrase, Train them to do everything I have told you. I love that word. Train them to do. Train them to do. Oh, how, how come it took so long for this to hit me? Train them to do. That's what Toby is involved with. So I want to contrast train them to do with another phrase, a phrase that we have adopted, really, kind of as, as the way that kind of this life is lived, train them to do or teach them to believe. Jesus never once asked his disciples to teach anyone to believe anything. It's remarkable. What does he ask them to do? Train them to do. Now, to be sure, the Bible talks about belief, and, and I would consider myself 
a believer. But believers in what? What am I a believer in? This is very important. And what we do here hinges on this idea. The word belief in the Newer Testament could be synonymous with the word trust. I'm a truster. I trust. Trust what? Trust in a way of life. Jesus asked us to trust in a way of life, not believe in a system of dogma. This is so important, friends. Listen to John chapter 3, verse 16. This is like the most like um, common verse in all the Bible, the most popular verse. In fact, you may have seen John 3, 16 on the sign held up by the guy with the rainbow wig in the Super Bowl. He's, that's the verse that guy is holding up all the time. John 3, 16. What does it say? Well, listen to this. God's care for humanity was so great that he sent his unique son among us so that those who count on him might not lead a futile and failing existence, but have the undying life of God himself. Those who count on him, there's the word trust. Those who trust in the way of Christ would not, leave, would not live a fruitless life, but have the undying life of God himself. How does it happen? How does counting on Christ keep us from living a futile and failing existence? Again, simple. Jesus didn't teach a belief system. He taught a way of life. One of my favorite passages at the very end of the sermon that he started in Matthew chapter 5 is Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus says this. Listen to how he kind of sums up this whole sermon. His, his kind of longest recorded sermon, he says it like this. Though those who hear me and do what I say, Am I, am I, is this something I'm doing wrong up here? It's bothering me. All right. Is that better? Okay. Matthew 7, 24, 25. Those who hear me and do what I say, hear me and do what I say. Now, I, the way that I was taught that was that means don't lie. It's not what it means. Now, I would generally be in favor of not lying. <laughs> I mean, not only generally. I'm wholeheartedly in favor of not lying. But that's not what he's talking about here. So Jesus says, those who hear me and do what I say are like those intelligent people who build their homes on the rock where rain and floods and winds cannot shake them. It's a training program. It's funny, isn't it? If you went this week to a, <clears throat> maybe you're, you know, you're, has anyone's office ever gotten like a new software program and no one knows how to use it? Right? And so they say there's going to be a week of training. We're going to send some key individuals off to this seminar, and they're going to learn how to use this software program. And you get to the seminar, and the guy says, you know, you really ought to learn to use this software program. You ought to use it because it's really good. This software program is the best news for accountants. And if you don't use it, you should be ashamed of yourself. What does that sound like? Sounds like the way that I was instructed kind of in Christianity. But that's not what I would hope for in a seminar on how to use software. I would actually leave the seminar. Uh, I mean, I would actually start the seminar and leave with a great hope that they would actually teach me how to do it. Right? I want to know how to use this stuff. And so that's what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is... How, and the great misunderstanding is that Jesus didn't come to bring a new belief system. In the sermon Jesus gave, gives in Matthew 5 through 7, he trained people on how to live a real life. Listen to this description. See if this seems, oh, there's my notes. See if this seems appealing to you. This is how you live a free and unshakable life. One free from loneliness, fear, and anxiety. Stop right there. I'm in. Free from loneliness. You can live, you can live right now in the situation that you're in with the people that you're with. In the, you don't have to change anything about your external circumstances, and you can begin to live a life free and unshakable, free from loneliness, fear, and anxiety, and filled with constant 
peace and joy. Sounds like, like something from Willy Wonka. Doesn't it? You can have the ability to love your neighbor as you do yourself. By the way, you can actually have the ability to love yourself. You can live free of anger, envy, lust, and covetousness. You no longer have to have a need for other people to praise you or even like you to be okay. You can have the inner inspiration and strength to leave a constant life of creative goodness. The strength and understanding. You can have the strength and understanding to bless those who are cursing you or cheating you or beating you out on, uh, for a new job at work or spitting on you in some confrontation and go the extra mile for someone who has unfairly asked you to drop what you're doing to help them again. That's the life that Jesus came How does that happen? It happens by learning your combinations and doing them. Now, here's the interesting thing. In Marin County, there are not very many people who would consider themselves Christian, and I don't wonder why. But you have to understand, the funny thing about it is they're not rejecting that kind of life. Who in the right mind would reject that life? It's like, you want to live that life? Jesus talks about it like this. It's a pearl of great price. And when there was a pearl merchant who found this pearl hidden in a field, and when he found it, he sold everything he had in order to buy that field to get that pearl. That's good news. The good news that Christ came to give is that you can live right now today just like that. Now, included in that are these three big ideas. No resentment, no reaction, inner peace. It doesn't have anything to do with what you believe. It has something to do with what you begin to do. Now, the belief comes in trusting the trainer. This is why I think Jesus is magnificent. Because he lived this kind of life. And what he longs to do through you and I is train other people to live that kind of life. That's what I'm in on. The question is, do you believe it's possible to live that kind of life? That's the funny thing. As so many of us have been in church for so long and haven't seen really anything change, I don't know what's going on today. (laughs) Daylight savings time, bam. So many of us have been in church for so long that, and we haven't seen anything change, and it's just like blah, 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 okay, fine. That's not the idea. That's not how this works. The way this works is we identify something in us that is bothering us. It's deeply troubling, like no no reaction. And you may have had a reaction this week that you regret. Man, how could I possibly live like that? Well, it's not about trying to really restrain yourself. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about a systemic change that happens from the inside out so you not only, you not only not have, don't, don't you have to restrain the, res, the, the reaction that you know is uh, going to get you into trouble, you don't have the desire to have that reaction anymore. And not only don't you have the desire for that kind of reaction, your desire actually begins to be to desire the compassionate response. That's what I want. Why didn't anybody tell me about this? I went to Bible college, and all I did was take tests after test after test on things that did not matter. Now, certainly, they matter in the grand scheme of things. Why do we have a class on understanding the top ten stories of the Old Testament and not have a class on training to overcome your problem with anger? That's what I want to know. Now, I love teaching about the Old Testament, and I taught that class. But I know angry people who know a lot about the Old Testament. (laughs) Right? Is this making sense? What Jesus came to show 
and share is a way of life, a lifestyle, not a belief system. So if we're going to get a hold of our reactions, we're not going to do it based on believing certain tenable, dynamic, doctrinal um, uh, principles of Scripture. It's not going to change anything. It's not going to help. So what will help? It's so funny. And I want to talk about what I said last week was this week I would give you some exercises like those combinations. I've been working on them. That, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about what you have to do every day in order to make something that's now impossible for you possible in the future. That's what training is. Now, it's not that we haven't talked about this before, but it's become more meaningful, more clear, more real to me over the last few weeks. You know, the beginning part of all of this is one simple phrase that I have to come to grips with, and it's perhaps the hardest. Simply this. I begin, the beginning part of all of this is simply this. I begin to accept that I'm accepted. See, if I don't accept that I'm accepted, this is why I train. I'm doing my combinations, and I'm going, God, see this? I'm doing this. Uh, and, and I'm doing this for you, all of this, just for you. And, and, and I'm, you know, we'll talk about the exercises in a minute. And I'm doing them not to create change in myself, but to finally get God's approval somehow. You see, that's what I thought these things were for when I was younger. I have to begin by understanding and accepting that I'm accepted. I am accepted by God. <laughs> I love that. Listen, we sang, the, um, we sang the song earlier of God's on our side. There's only two kinds of people in the world. This, this is how I used to think. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those people who God are on their side and those people whose God is their enemy. It's God's... You know, what nonsense. There's only two kinds of people in the world. Those who know God's on their side and those who haven't yet realized that God's on their side. God's on your side. Nothing you can do, say, become will ever change that. The beginning is realizing it's already true. That's what Jesus did. That's what got the religious leaders so ticked off. Does this make sense? And we could talk about story after story after story, and I would love to. But we don't have time right now. But, I mean, any story. Just pick a story. Jesus shows up. And what does he say? I love this story about this woman who breaks this jar of perfume and anoints his feet for burial. He's in a dinner party. And she does this. And one of the, the hosts of the party is thinking in his mind, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't even let her touch her, him. I mean, what kind of a... And Jesus is like, dude, are you kidding me? And what does he do to this woman? She's earned the money, by the way, for this perfume through prostitution. What does Jesus do to this woman? My dear woman, you are loved and accepted and forgiven, and it's going to be okay. Every other eye in the room, judgment. You can give It's like a toddler coming up to you, trying to be accepted or loved by their performance. They bring you from preschool this painting. It's a horrible looking stick figure with wiry hair. And they say, This is you, mommy. And what do you say? Oh, it's beautiful. It's breathtaking. It's, and it goes on the refrigerator. 
And, and that is a prized possession forever. One day you'll be going through a stack of papers and you'll find it and your eyes will fill with tears when this child is now 40. Why? Because it was beautiful and perfect. Now, if an art historian looked at it, they would say, oh my gosh, it's worthless. Right? It's the person that's accepted. And the things that they do then become acts of beauty. Now, following Jesus simply means arranging my life around certain activities that will train my heart to be filled with and overflow with the fruits of the Spirit. That's all this is. Let me read those to you. By the way, you know, I have rewritten my job description. Now, I haven't told anybody this. So it's not official. But listen to this. It's actually the Apostle Paul writing to a young pastor named Timothy. And I like to consider myself a very, very young pastor. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-10, to 10, Paul writes this. Listen to these words. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teaching has come through hypoc- uh, hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. Listen to this. They forbid certain people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Now listen. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you'll be a good shepherd of Christ. Nourished on the truths of the faith, and the good teaching that you have followed have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. There it is. Train for it. For physical training, so if there's any question about what kind of training Paul is talking about, he's talking about Olympic training. Olympic-like training. We're talking about a person who's living in Greece. This passage is written somewhere around 50 A.D. There was a huge uh, Olympics in 51. And chances are this guy was there. Or at least, I mean, it was just the culture. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value over all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. What is, what is the value of training my, my heart? I'm not training my heart to get into heaven in the next life. Paul says it right here. This kind of training has value in this life and in the life to come. But he says in the life to come, as an incidental clause in the original language, it will happen. But it's not the primary reason. The primary reason is to have a beautiful life now, the life of the ages, eternal life. It is the good news. It's the life that I described earlier when I was describing and kind of just writing down what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the life that all of us long for. How did this get so screwed up? So that to me and others, Christianity had become just some kind of a bad behavior management tool. Listen to this. I didn't finish. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. This is why we labor and strive. There's two words again. Labor and strive. It's like CrossFit. (laughs) Right, Candy? Because we have put our hope in the living God. Listen to this. I love this. Who is the Savior of all people. Now, this this is worth the price of admission right here, this phrase. He is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. What does that mean? Well, Paul says that God is the Savior of all people. What is all people? How many people are in the all people category? All people. But especially those who trust, who believe this lifestyle. Why? Because something begins to happen now if I believe this way. If I trust a lifestyle and begin to train 
the salvation that God promises begins now when I become much less of the old Joe and much more of the Joe that's possible because of a life with God. That is what I long for. If I begin training, my reactions will stop and my compassionate responses will start and it won't be by me going, oh, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. I've tried that. It doesn't work. Right? Does it work? Now it works for a while, but eventually you're going to say it. So this life, here's how Paul describes it in Galatians 5. What happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Love that. How does fruit appear in an orchard? Naturally. I'm just picking the last apples off of the apple tree that Brian and I planted in my backyard. All I have to do is give the tree what it needs to be healthy. The tree makes the apples. See, that's the way it works. All you have to do is give yourself what you need to be healthy, and you will create these beautiful things. This is the life that we're talking about, and the training things that we're talking about are the things that I would do to the apple tree. Pruning, fertilizing. I mean, now, I have to say, that's not easy stuff. If you could personify that apple tree for just a second, and you saw me coming at you as the apple tree with the pruners, what would you say? No, 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 I'm good. I'll, whatever you say, I'll do it. No, sorry, lop, 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 lop. And it's painful, but that has to go. And the tree looks down and says, oh, it's, it's gone. I, I thought I needed that. And then it realizes not only didn't it need it, but it's actually producing more fruit without it. Oh, that's the life. God brings these things as fruit appears in an order. Things like, here's another list. Listen to this. See if you're in or out. Affection for others. Exuberance about life. Serenity. A willingness to stick with things. A sense of compassion in the heart. A conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. That's all there is. That's the life. That's why I'm in this thing. So, what is my work in this? I'm just giving you three. I'm giving you three exercises. Now, if you were at the physical therapist, you just had your knee replaced. <laughs> and the physical therapist said, congratulations, operation was successful. Now, I, I can't do any more for you. The doctor did the surgery, and it's good. Now, you go home, and you do these exercises. And if you do them... You will have great mobility, and your knee will be successful. If you don't do them, you're screwed. And there's nothing I can do about it, right? That's the way this works. There's three exercises. If you do them, beautiful things will begin happening in this reaction versus responding area of your life. If you don't do them, there's nothing I can do about it. You're screwed. That's just the way it is. I mean, that's just the way it is. Now, these aren't the only three, and, and I don't, I don't, what I'm not saying is these are the three and don't do anything else. No, here are three good ideas based on years and years and years of people helping other people do this. Number one, be rested. You work too much. You know, sleep is a spiritual practice. One of the Ten Commandments, honor the Sabbath keep it holy. What was the Sabbath? The day when you didn't work. Just don't work. And actually, you didn't recreate. I like to recreate when I'm not working. In fact, when I'm not working, I like to work. Now, I work on other things, the yard, garden, motorcycles, and it feels relaxing and good. I get that, but you have to understand it's not rest. Rest is rest. Be rested. You need to sleep. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do on a Sunday morning is sleep in. Till 9.15. <laughs> Listen to Psalm 127. 
It's useless, God says, to rise up early and go to bed late and work your worried fingers to the bone. Don't you know he enjoys giving rest to those he loves? See, the reason most of us don't sleep enough and work too hard is because we think we actually have control over the outcomes in our life. You don't. If you read the Gospels, you'll understand that Jesus was a man who had urgent work to do, and he knew what his work was, but he rested well. He slept. Uh, There's lots of stories about it. One in particular, he's going across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. A big storm blows up. Disciples are, this is, you know, this is, see, this is, this story is the story, our story. The disciples are afraid they're going to perish, right? Right? They're bailing water. They're doing all kinds of things. They're taking down sails. They're rowing. I mean, these are fishermen, men who knew how to live on the Sea of Galilee. They've experienced storms like this, and they're doing all of those things. Where's Jesus? He's sleeping. How irresponsible of him. They finally wake him up. Don't you care about us? I love that when people ask him, don't you care about us? I love that. And by the way, if you, ever, if, you, if you find yourself asking God that question, just hear that question coming out of your mouth to God. It's a beautiful question. It's a starting point. Because what I want you to hear in response is, my friend, nobody loves you like I do. You just don't understand what love is. That's what the fruit tree says. Don't you love me? Put those pruners down. No, I do love you. That branch has got to go. So they wake him up. Don't you care if we all drown? And Jesus gets up and he says, Peace, Irene, be still, stop. The waves die down. And the men go, Whoa, Who is this guy? And Jesus says, I'm sad. I wish your faith was stronger. You know, I used to think if their faith was stronger, they could have stopped the storm themselves. That's what I thought he meant. How silly. What he meant was, If your faith were just a little stronger, the storm would not have bothered you and you would have slept through it just like I was sleeping through. Story after story after story about sleep. How much do you need, really? Really? What keeps you from getting it? There's no way you're going to be able to do this unless you get some rest. It's a training regime. It's the hardest training you're ever going to be involved in. So... Rest. Is there anybody here that does not do well if they're tired or hungry? (laughs) I'll tell you one thing. Mother Teresa, tired and hungry, she would just go nuts. You know, she would go crazy on you, like that Snickers commercial. It's just the way it works. You need to be rested. So that's the first practice. Well, that doesn't seem very spiritual. Well, that's because we don't understand what's spiritual and what isn't spiritual. Sleep is a spiritual activity. Sleep. Just sleep. Number two. So this week, how much sleep do you need? Get it. That's all I'm saying. Just get it. Go to bed earlier. Turn on the DVR. That's the great thing about living on the West Coast when you're in the World Series. Those poor sons of guns in Boston, their game doesn't start till 8 o'clock. But not here. Secondly, be present. What's the exercise for being present? And and what do I mean? Well, the exercise for being present is meditation. You have to meditate. You have to get quiet. If you don't, this isn't going to work. That's all I'm saying. I don't like meditation. I don't care. I don't want to get quiet. Then don't, but it's not going to change. Well, you sound awfully directive. It's true. Because I'm the physical therapist telling you, if you don't do this, your knee's going to lock up, and that's going to be that. And it's your fault. It's fun to say that. You'll not be able to respond with compassion unless you're living from your heart. You will not be able to live from your heart unless you train to be more present or mindful. You will not be able to be more present until you learn to quiet your mind. You will not be able to quiet your mind unless you embrace the beauty of what it means to meditate. Now, there's lots of ways to do that. But you have to do it. 
Time does not allow to unpack all the Scripture has to say about this. Just one passage that many of us know. In the Psalms, God looks on a people that are hurried and helpless, and He says, Be still and know. What's the word He uses? Be still and know, Yahweh, I am. What does that mean? See, what happens when you're quiet on purpose, not sitting with a book, is your brain just goes off. What are you doing? You know, you got things to do. You promise this and promise that. You should be here, you should be there, and your brain is just going. And unless you'd let it talk itself out and descend into your heart, now, your heart isn't where your emotions are. Your emotions are in your brain. I'm talking about the center of who you are, where you'll find God, by the way. Unless you let your mind talk yourself out, talk itself out, you'll never be able to understand why you're reacting in the first place. It's funny. Meditate. Now, we have a meditation group that meets on Thursday nights. You're welcome to join us. If that doesn't work for you, let I really want to learn ballet and I want to be a, I want to, you know, I want to do this, but I don't want to do these exercises. Well, I, I'm sorry. That's the funny thing about me, and I mean, I love the way Bill plays the guitar, and I always say, ah, if I could only play the guitar like that, but I don't really want to play the guitar, or I would, right? If I wanted to play the guitar, I mean, really, if that was my deep desire, and I wanted to rearrange my life so that I could play it, I could take lessons, and I would probably never be as good as some others or as Bill, but I could actually learn to play the guitar. But I don't want to, badly enough, to begin to practice. This is the point. This is, this is the way of Jesus. Rearranging your life so that you begin to practice the things that bring the fruit that you long for. One more. Be rested. Just get some sleep. The other problem with meditation is if you're not rested, guess what? Yeah, that's what happens, all right. And that, that's a good thing, too. I mean, you, you find yourself snoring away right in the middle, and uh, you go, you know, I might need to get some more sleep. One more exercise. Be curious. What do you mean, be curious? I love him. Remember him? There's a, an old tool that the ancients have passed down called the daily examine. Daily, and more often, pay attention to how your day went. You just sit down and you work through your day. You just kind of go over it in your mind. And you present it to God. Maybe the last thing you do before you go to sleep. There are some ideas bulleted here. Just become aware of God's presence. You get quiet. You review your day with gratitude. I mean... All of the goods and the bads that happened that day. Pay attention to what kind of caused you to react. Boy, that, that didn't go so good when this or that happened. What's that about, God? What was going on there? Why did I get so excited? Face your shortcomings. Embrace your victories. And then say to God, God, I'm looking forward to trying this again tomorrow. Now, listen. Listen. Uh, by the way, on your way out, uh, I've just copied off a paper called the examine. Take one of these with you, put it by your bedside, and this gives you those steps. Just do them at night. That's all. Just do them. <laughs> it's just, I don't know what to say. I, I, fail, I feel the frustration that a physical therapist must feel. So, so if, if this doesn't appeal to you right now, it's okay. Let it go by. But there are some of us who are ready for this. And so it's time to do it. I don't want to react the way I used to react. I just don't want to. That's all. I just don't want to. I not serve now. I wonder what I have to do. Reaction that 
I may have used in the past in the very same circumstance. It's simple. What I have to do is rearrange my life around certain practices that make something possible that is now, right now, by direct effort, impossible for me. Just like running a marathon or dancing ballet. Now, I have to say, if I did those exercises, I still would not dance ballet. (laughs) But everybody in this room can begin to change from the inside out. So what once caused you agitation, now you handle with poise and beauty. You can. But it's not magic. With Marilyn's permission, uh, Marilyn and Walt at a great communion table, with Marilyn's permission, I'm going to ask to postpone communion until next week. But I'd like to have our a cappella group come up and, uh, and close us with a song. It's a beautiful song. See, the way that this works is, is that every day I have to do the things I have to do in order to become the person I want to be. And what I put into it is what I get out of it. That's just how it works. It's one of those rules of life. And as I was saying earlier, it's not magic. You cannot pray enough and say, God, please help my response to be more loving. God's, it's, it's just like me saying, it's just like me saying after my knee replacement, which is imminent, God, please help my knee to be more flexible. God's looking down and going, dude, that's not my job. You want your knee to be more flexible? Do your exercises. You don't have to pray about this. I'm not going to do it. That's the way this works. And so I can say, God, please help me to be more patient. Please help my responses to be more loving. Please give me some kind of an inner peace. Where are you? Why aren't you doing this? And he's like, I'm out on that. But you have a lot to do with all of those things. So practice makes permanent. That's what I know. And my encouragement to you is to just begin with these three things. In whatever way you understand them, send me an email if you want more explanation. And, and we're going to be talking about this, you know, for the next 25 years. So it's going to take that. It's okay. When you're quiet this week, you'll know whether you accept being accepted or not. That's the first thing that comes to your mind. Because you'll hear the voices. You know, you're really not going to be able to do this. That's the voice. You've tried it before and it didn't work. I don't know what you think is different now. You're, you're just not that kind of person. Some people are cut out for it. Some people aren't. It's just not going to work for you. I mean, you might as well get up and wash the dishes like you know you should anyway. That's the voice. That's when you come to God and say, God, it's obvious that I don't look at myself like you do. I need your help. So let's pray. And then these good people sing for us. So Father, I'm grateful for you. And I'm grateful for a little clarity, God, about what's your job and what's my job. And I pray, Father, that you would help all of us to understand, first of all, that you look at us with a great deal of love, care, and fondness. And there's nothing we have to do, nothing we can do to change that. And from there, God, we can begin to rearrange our life around certain practices that will allow us to do things that we cannot now do. Hmm. We long for that life, Father, to bring a remedy to our soul and a remedy to our family and a remedy to our neighborhood and our community, and our world. And so I pray that you would help us with this. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's listen together.